No, dude, the the, bi the building is collapsed. I woke up because I was hearing some noise. I couldn't understand what was happening. I looked out outside the patio area, the pool area. Uh -huh. the pool area starts uh -huh. sinking down, so there will be many, many people there. Okay. okay. We have police and paramedics on the way there. Are you are you still in your apartment or are you on the ground? On June 24, 2021, at approximately 1.22 a.m., the 12-story L-shaped residential building in Surfside suffered a partial collapse. 55 units were completely destroyed out of the 136 units. The building was built back in 1981, and at the time of the collapse, it was 40 years old. Now, this condo is part of a complex. There's a north building and a south building as well. And the south building is the one that suffered the collapse. And they're both located along the ocean front of Miami, Florida within the Surfside community. Now this was one of the biggest North American building disasters in history. And on that night, 98 lives were lost, which I believe could have been completely prevented because the building was showing signs. Now it's been over a year since the disaster, but what steps have been taken into account in order to avoid another potential disaster? And what are some potential causes that led to the building collapsing? And what could we as residents living in these buildings, what can we do to avoid a potential disaster from happening? I'll be sharing my experience as an architect, but before we dive into answering these questions, it's important for us to understand first, what exactly happened that night? There were a sequence of events that took place on the night that the building collapsed. At approximately 1.14 a.m., a ground floor resident heard a loud sound and they went to the lobby to report it to the security and then noticed that the pool deck actually partially collapsed. Around 1.18 a.m., a tourist walking by the parking garage entrance noticed water pouring from the ceiling. They grabbed their cell phone and started recording. You'll see through the footage that the ceiling is partially collapsed and water is pouring down into the parking garage. Then at approximately 1.24 a.m., the building collapsed within 12 seconds. 911 calls started to pour in of residents reporting that the pool deck collapsed first and they saw the building completely collapse within seconds. Holy what? Yeah, hold on. Okay. I'm trying to check them. He is mapping at 88th Street in Collins Hurry up, hurry up! He's, There's a big he's, he's reporting a collapse in the garage. I think the roof collapsed in the building. A bunch of us are in the garage, but we cannot get out. And we're going back up to our apartment, but some of the hallways are blocked and there's water coming in through the bottom, through the garage. A, a very large building collapse. Next like the door. building next to us is gone. The patio area, the pool area, uh -huh. the pool, pool area starts uh -huh. sinking down. So what's important to note is that the pool deck collapsed first, as reported by many of the residents and neighbors within the area on that night. Then the middle portion of the building collapsed. Then the eastern building wing actually remained standing for a few seconds, but shortly after that too collapsed. However, the western wing of the building remained standing. And I believe that it remained standing because of the elevator core. So at that portion where the building stopped collapsing, that's where the elevator core is located. And an elevator core plays such an important part of the structural design of a building, and it's perhaps the strongest portion of the building. So you'll notice in many tall buildings that the structural core is always located in the middle, and that helps to distribute the forces throughout the floor plate. And so that elevator core, I believe, helps to stop the remainder of the west wing to collapse because that elevator core contains these thick concrete walls also known as shear walls and they provide a continuous vertical support that help resist sideway forces the remaining portion of the building that west wing was eventually demolished on july 4th due to safety concerns that it would eventually collapse as well a day before the collapse june 23rd the building was going through inspections in order 
order to receive the 40-year recertification. And as part of that certification process, the building needs to go through inspections by structural engineers and contractors to flag any issues that the building is having that may pose a safety concern for the residents. And those items would then get repaired and fixed in order to ensure that the building is in good maintenance and is in good condition in order for residents to continue to live within the building. Two days before the collapse, June 22nd, a pool contractor noticed damage within the pool equipment room, which was located within the lower parking level. There were cracks in the concrete, exposed rebar, standing water along the floors and in the parking area as well. He was shocked to see all of that damage and it really looked to him that there was a lack of maintenance within the building. He reported this to the staff member that was giving him a tour at the time when he was conducting an inspection in order to put a bid together for the repairs required for the pool and he also reported to his supervisor what he saw that day. And to him, what he saw wasn't normal. There was something unusual about the building's condition. Then the following day on June 25th, city officials actually released documents of a structural engineer's report, field survey report, of his inspection of the building where he discovered major structural damage within the parking level which corresponded to what the pool contractor was saying then between 1996 and 2013 there were several attempts to repair the pool deck slab at least four attempts that were reported within the structural field survey that the structural engineer conducted and those repairs were not done properly and they were just band-aid solutions to deeper issues within the building. And this leads us into the possible cause that led to the collapse of the building. In my opinion, a disaster of this magnitude, one does not happen overnight and isn't due to one single factor, but rather several factors that snowball together to create this storm. Now, the cause of the building collapsing is still a mystery. Investigations are still ongoing to discover what were the causes that led to the building collapse. And so far, there aren't any clear answers as to what was the leading factor to the building collapsing. Now, uh, there are many possibilities of shoddy construction, bad design, faulty materials, and so on. But there hasn't been a determination yet of what is the main cause. And it's been over a year since the collapse of the building. Based on the information available online and reports from experts, I believe in my opinion, there are six possible causes that led to the building's collapse. And again, I don't believe it was one cause. I believe it was several causes that together created this storm. But before we dive into the possible causes, it's important for us to understand how the building is laid out and roughly the concept of the building. Now the building is actually not quite 12 stories. It's 12 and a half stories because on the 13th level, they have a half level, which is the pent house level. The building sits along a pool deck slab and along the south west corner of the site there is a pool and jacuzzi at the west corner of the site there is a driveway entrance that leads into above grade parking and you'll notice that the building actually cantilevers over that above grade parking under this pool deck is an underground parking garage and it's one level of underground parking and along the north side of the site there is a parking ramp entrance that leads into the parking level on the ground floor level you have some residential units you have some amenity space and then you have just some building services on that ground floor and you have building entrances so along the upper levels you have all of the residential apartment units now you'll notice as well that within this building floor plate you have a main structural core which contains the elevator shafts and that's located at the pinch of the l-shaped building so it's located right in the middle here so there's a fire exit along the southeast corner and the northwest corner as well this is just a typical floor plate layout and then you have all the residential units on the perimeter now that we understand the building's layout and concept the first possible cause that i think led to the building collapsing was the lack of building maintenance now upon reading reports and doing some research on the building itself it is so clear to me that there was a lack of building maintenance and this is so important i think we take this for granted within our buildings and within our homes you can't just be within a building live within it and just ignore 
ignore all of the signs and all of the signals that the building is giving you. And no building can last 40 years or 50 years without any maintenance either because materials and the building itself through time and through weather requires care and requires replacing parts and fixing and repairing any issues that it may have. Now, the sooner you can repair any issues that the building's having, the better, because not only are you catching those repairs early on, which is gonna reduce a lot of the costs up front, because if you don't repair it right away, then it's just gonna get worse, and that increases the cost as well to fix the issue, and it's a lot more difficult as well. So if you're able to catch the issue and fix it early on, you not only save a lot of money, but in the long run, it's a lot better for the building as well. And by maintaining the building and keeping it in good health, you're just creating a safer environment for everyone. Now, Surfside was actually going through a 40 year recertification process. Within the region, buildings that turn 40 need to go through inspections. And this is to ensure that the building is structurally sound, safe, and any issues that the building's having would be addressed and repaired in order to get the recertification process to indicate that the building is sound and safe and in good condition for residents to live. So prior to the collapse, the building was going through inspections. In October 2018, as part of that process, a structural engineer prepared a survey field report which documented any structural issues, any repairs that needed to be done, along with a cost estimate for the work that needed to be completed. The total cost for the repairs was 9.1 million, and a large part of that was for the pool deck. It was the most expensive item on the list at an approximately $3.8 million. The lower parking level also needed a lot of work. There was waterproofing issues, and so on. The building facade also needed a lot of repairs and that was an additional $3.2 million. These repairs were planned for 2021. So some of the repairs didn't get fully completed because the building collapsed. Now, one of the major items that lacked maintenance was the pool deck. There were water leaks throughout, cracked concrete and so on. And this was noted by the pool contractor that photographed damage in the pool equipment room along the Southwest corner of the site. And so that pool equipment room is on the lower parking level, just under the pool and jacuzzi area on the ground floor level. And what he noticed was appalling. He couldn't believe what he saw. He saw a lot of damage, water standing on the floors of the lower level, including the parking area as well, and the pool equipment room, cracked concrete with exposed rebar, which to me is a huge indicator, a red flag. When you're seeing exposed rebar and it's rusting and eroding and there's corrosion, that is not good because what's happening there is that's really affecting the structural integrity of the steel. And concrete is nothing without steel. Without the reinforcement of the rebar, concrete is not structurally sound. So seeing that kind of damage is a huge red flag. And for the pool contractor, he was surprised and shocked to see this type of damage. So corrosion, exposed rebar in concrete and cracking concrete are huge indicators of the lack of maintenance that was within the building. Now the pool contractor and the structural engineer investigation both noted and expressed a corroding rebar in the concrete within the slab over overhead. Buildings along the coastline are more susceptible to spalling. This is when the reinforcing steel inside the concrete rusts and expands up to seven times its volume. And the concrete that surrounds the seal breaks because of the increased volume. This causes significant deterioration in the structural integrity of that column or of that beam. So concrete damage has a huge impact. And I believe this is even a bigger question for buildings overall because most buildings around the world are all constructed out of concrete, the majority of them. So this is very important for us to begin to take seriously and even understand better the importance of maintaining our concrete buildings and how important it is to take care of buildings that are showing concrete damage and the importance of repairing them properly. The structural engineer mentioned this in the report that there were attempts to fix the pool deck or to fix some of the concrete damage that was within the building, but none of it was properly done. Also part of the lack of maintenance in the building was the 
failure to replace the waterproofing. And this was perhaps one of the leading possible causes to the collapse that I believe really contributed to the collapse of the building was the lack of attention and care for replacing the waterproofing. The pool contractor also noticed along the parking spot 78 that there was a large puddle of water just standing there. This reported water in the parking level was also reported in the 2018 field report that the structural engineer conducted. He also raised a red flag that that parking level had a major air in the original design that was causing serious damage to the slab which in turn is affecting the structural concrete and affecting the structural integrity of the slab and that water that's just standing there is really causing damage to the concrete slab and it was constantly reported that there was always water standing within the parking level of the building. The second possible cause is the construction quality. Now engineers reported preliminary observations. Now this could change with time as they are investigating the situation but there were observations. The critical columns that provided a lot of the support were actually missing steel reinforcement. Now there were columns that had half of the amount of reinforcement steel that were specified in the drawings. So within the original plans, there were a certain amount of reinforcement steel that was specified for those columns. But upon the construction of the building, half of it was provided. The engineers discovered when they were comparing the drawings with the wreckage, they noticed that something wasn't right. Upon a closer look, it appeared that there was a fewer number of rods within the columns. And in some areas, only two pieces of rebar were seen. So that is about half of what was expected and specified in the drawings. Now, reinforcement steel is very important because concrete is nothing without the reinforcement steel. That is what provides the structural ability for that concrete. And together they form a great combination and provide structural integrity for the building. Now, concrete is known to be great in compression, but it doesn't do so well in tension and so the structural steel reinforcement that is placed within the concrete allows it to do well with tension and compression so it's important when drawing specify a certain amount and a certain type and a certain size of structural steel within the columns that that gets constructed as closely as possible to the drawings there are engineers that argue that those columns didn't lead to the building collapse. And there's a mix of opinions if those columns actually played a factor in the collapse of the building. But I do believe with those columns failing, it affects the slab and that slab affects the entire building. So with those columns failing, it impacts the slab and it's just a domino effect. The third possible cause that I believe that could have led to the collapse was the design quality. There was a major flaw in the design that led to a lot of water being accumulated within the slabs, which in turn damaged the slab and its structural integrity because that water was damaging the concrete and the steel within. Now, this issue was flagged by the structural engineer in the 2018 field report, which noted failed waterproofing. And that failed waterproofing was causing a lot of the structural damage to the building. And in that report, the structural engineer mentioned that the failure to address the failed waterproofing proofing and not replacing it will cause an extent of the concrete deterioration to expand exponentially. The slab was not engineered in a way that it's sloping to a drain to allow that water to escape, but rather it was designed as a flat structure and that allowed for water just to accumulate and just sit there for days until it evaporates. And that caused a lot of damage to the structural slab. Now this leads us into the fourth possible cause damage caused by construction on the adjacent site. Now there are several residents that voiced concerns that the building's structural integrity was being affected by the construction of the 18 story residential building on the south side of the building. Now construction of this building started back in 2016 and was completed in 2019. Residents reported that they felt shaking and movement within the building when the construction 
was ongoing. Now, I believe this is where city officials could have gone involved to ensure that the construction that was happening in that building wasn't affecting the adjacent building and just evaluate the concerns of the residents with what was going on on the adjacent site. Because this could very well have been a causing factor. Now, do I think it was the main factor? Perhaps not. But do I think that, that it could have changed the soil condition and that movement could have affected the foundations of the Surfside building? It could have for sure. An evaluation should have been conducted to eliminate that possibility and to eliminate the possibility of it affecting the foundations of the Surfside building. A fifth possibility of the collapse could have been sinking. Now, a study from Florida International University was published in 2022 that found that the building has been sinking at a rate of about two millimeters per year during the 1990s. Now, this study didn't focus on this particular building. It was more of a general study of the area, but it does show some concerning factors that could have affected the foundation of the building and the structural integrity. It does make you question how much the building could have been sinking at the time that it did collapse. Now it's also important to note because it's by the coastline, it makes it a very sensitive site to begin with. In order for a building to be its best, to live a long lifespan, there are three main principles a building needs to adhere by. One, design quality is important. Ensuring that the architecture and engineering concepts are of good quality, from the structural concept to the design concept, ensuring that that building has a good foundation for it to perform its best is critical. So design plays an important role, making sure that waterproofing is taken in consideration, sloping those slabs. Those bones play the foundation for the building because you can have a great design on paper that has all of the elements and components for the building to be successful. But two, if the construction is not done well, you can have the best of plans. So even though you may specify the proper amount of rebar, and you may specify everything that needs to be done for that building to perform, that output is important too. So in this case, if the columns did have missing rebar, it doesn't matter if the drawings had specified eight rods, but only two or four rods were placed in the column. So as part of the design, construction quality is very important and making sure that the design is executed well into the construction phase as well. So Quality control within the construction phase is as important as the design and they both go hand in hand. Maintenance over time is critical because a building could have the best design and the best structural design concept and it can be executed well within the construction phase. However, if it's not being maintained over the lifespan of the building, then that goes to waste as well because the building needs care. It's exposed to extreme weather and it's exposed to so many elements and wear and tear throughout the course of time, it needs that care. And as soon as you could repair and evaluate those issues within the building, the better because it reduces the cost and it ultimately reduces the severity of the damage. And so you could have the best design, but if you're not taking care of the buildings and you're not being mindful of the issues that are ongoing within the building and addressing them in a timely manner, then it can lead to damaging effects within the building. And in this case, it could lead to a building collapsing. Now, something of this scale, a magnitude does not happen overnight. It just doesn't. Clearly, as we can see from this discussion, there were underlining issues that the building was presenting. And it's important for us to note that buildings do speak. This brings us into diving into the past of the building, which upon researching, I learned that it has a troubled past. The construction history of this project is quite interesting to say the least. During the early 1980s, the construction period in Miami was the Wild West, known at the time for its uneven enforcement of regulations. However, the Surfside Towers did stand out from the rest. The development team from the engineers, architects, and the developer all had a checkered past leading into this project. At the time, the developer of the project was actually running away from Canada in order to avoid 
tax invasion issues that they were experiencing within the country. And so they came to Miami and they saw this vision to develop Surfside. There was a shortage of housing. And so developers saw this as an opportunity for new development. Now at the time when building permits were rolling in, the city was struggling with water and sewer systems for new developments. So the developers came up with a solution to provide $200,000, which at the time is actually quite a lot of money, toward the needed upgraded coverage that was needed for the water and sewer systems. And this was half of the cost that the city actually needed in order to conduct the work. And so for them, this was a great project, a great partnership. So on November 13, 1979, the town approved the overall building permit for the project. As construction began on the project, there started to begin more turmoil within the project with the city officials because the plans began changing. As I had mentioned earlier, there were some last minute design changes that happened to the project when the building started construction. All of a sudden, now the developer decided to add another level with penthouse units and this frustrated the city officials because they approved one thing and all of a sudden now they're adding another level to the building and this was also violating the height limits of that region and the developer never brought up this idea of adding an additional level to the building until construction started and after receiving the building permit at one point the city building department did place a stop work order however this led into an intense campaign that saw lawyers from the developer side trying to sue city officials. And so then city officials just decided to approve the plans. So in the end, the developers did get that additional floor to the building. However, there's no clear answer if this could have been one of the causes leading to the collapse, but having this rush of last minute changes does impact the project. Now, one expert did say that the penthouse addition would not explain the cause of the collapse since buildings are designed with large safety margins. So engineers do calculate a margin of safety when they are designing the structure concept of the building. So some engineers have reported that that's not really a concern and not really one of the factors that could have led to it, but there's a possibility because it's not really clear as to what were the changes or what were the consideration that went into place upon adding additional penthouse units to the project. Now, the developer definitely had a troubled and checkered past. However, they weren't the only member in the team that had a shady past. The architect had their license suspended for six months in 1967 upon an investigation of one of the projects of the architect. They designed a signed structure and that structure actually fell. And so their license got suspended for the failed design. The structural engineer of the project also experienced issues five years prior to the Surfside building, where officials later discovered that the parking garage walls were actually lacking reinforcement steel within the concrete. And this was important because those walls needed to prevent cars from crashing through the wall. Now, I do think that this does impact the project because having the right professionals on a project makes a huge difference. That quality and design plays an important role for that building to be successful in the long run. Now that we have a better understanding of some of the issues around the building, what were some of the changes that happened after the collapse of the building? Unfortunately, a lot of times it takes a disaster like this to really change things. So since the collapse, there has been a new law. Before buildings across Florida were technically not required to be inspected by an engineer or an architect after being built or occupied. Now that this has happened, once a building turns either 25 or 30 years old, depending on its proximity to the coastline, it needs to be inspected again every 10 years afterward. I think this is a great addition and it really enforces building maintenance and really making sure that the building is in good health and that if there are any red flags that they get addressed right away. And it's important for engineers and a licensed professional to go in and evaluate the damages that need to be repaired or evaluate the building structural integrity, evaluate the waterproofing and so on to ensure that the building is safe. And I think 
think waiting for a building to turn 40 is not the answer. That's way too late. And we see this within this case that inspections were underway and there were repairs that were starting to be made, like the roof was starting to be repaired. However, it was done too late. It was just too close at the lifespan of that building. And so now that they have put this law into place that every 10, 30, and then again, every 10 years, the building needs to be evaluated by a licensed professional. I think this is a great new law that has taken into place. And being more strict is definitely a good way to go about it and really ensuring that buildings are safe for everyone to live in and just ensuring stronger buildings in general within our communities. Also, upon the collapse of the building on June 26, there was an evaluation of all of the tall buildings within Surfside and Miami, evaluating their structural integrity. So an immediate audit was conducted of all of the high rise buildings within Miami. I believe this also brings into question a bigger lesson and something that we need to move forward on because most of the buildings, most of the residential buildings throughout the world, throughout North America are built from concrete. One thing that is really apparent is that modern concrete and concrete structures, they are very reactive active to the environment. Extreme reactivity from iron makes concrete vulnerable. So exposed rebar just makes the structural integrity very vulnerable. Overall, we need to address and learn how we can do better with these aging structures and how we could also find better solutions to maintain these buildings as well. What role can we do to help prevent such a devastating disaster from happening? As a resident, Try to get as involved as possible as part of that building. You know, get involved in the buildings association, know your property management, have conversation with them. And if you see anything that's unusual, make sure to report it. Report anything that you hear, anything that you see, and then follow up with them. Make sure that actions are being taken into consideration to resolve the issue and that repairs are gonna be completed and that they're taking into consideration your concerns about the building and voice those concerns and don't shy away from making sure you hold them accountable to what's happening to the building. This is very important because as residents, we can come together and with numbers, you can really apply the pressure to property management to make sure that the building is being taken care of properly and that action is being taken into place if there are any repairs that need to be done. Because building maintenance is very important. I would say it's the most critical part of the whole process. The design is important and the construction quality, but without maintenance, you don't have the other two elements. You know, you need all three elements to make sure you have a sound build Building, but I really feel strongly about building maintenance and really addressing any of the design issues. Like even if there is a design issue, there is a solution to that. And that could be resolved with building maintenance and addressing that issue to find a better solution to solve that problem. So if waterproofing is a problem, there are solutions that you can work with professionals to solve that issue and not let it just progress and get worse and cause other issues to arrive. And then you have concrete structural issues and it it's a whole mess. This reminds me the other day uh, in my parking garage, I noticed there was a crack on the wall and I my parking spot is right against a sheer wall. Like it's right against a, a, a big wall. So I'm parked right against it. And I looked up and I noticed something unusual because I'm like, this is not normal. I noticed there's a crack. It wasn't a big crack. It was a hairline crack. But within that crack, I noticed water was just pouring out. And I look and the water was just pouring along the walls and on the floor. All the floors are sloped and that's how it should be to allow water to drain down into a drain. So all of the water was flowing into a drain, which is good, but there was a crack on the wall and there was water just shooting out of the wall. And I noticed that and I made sure to document it. I took a video and a photo, I believe I did both. So I documented what was happening and I sent a quick email to property management. I'm like, hey, there's something unusual happening on my parking level and there's water just pouring out of that wall. You know, it's not normal. And they're like, oh yes, we are aware of it. We saw the issue. We're getting someone in. They're coming in to solve the issue. It's the water tank that's located on that area. It's flowing over and then it's 
cutting through the concrete walls and we're trying to address it as quickly as possible. I'm like, okay, great. It does need to get resolved right away because you don't want that kind of water to just be pouring through the concrete walls because that could create other issues. When I went about my day and I came back, I noticed that the water was still pouring and I think it took the following day. Yeah, I believe the following day, the issue was still there. So I followed up with property management. I'm like, hey, it's already been two days and it's a lot of water. They're like, yes, we're on it. We, you know, and they gave their reasonings and so on. And then I noticed the following day, the issue was resolved. So I was on top of it. I knew how critical this was and I wasn't gonna let the issue go by without anyone addressing it. So I made sure to follow up with property management and I made sure that it was getting addressed and they were working on it. And I can tell they were working on it based on the emails and the information they were giving me. I'm like, okay, they, they are working on it. So it's not something that they are ignoring. And this brings us to the second point, which is so important, is to understand your fire exit. When I was researching this project, I was listening to the 911 calls that were pouring in when the building collapsed. One of the residents on the west wing, which was the portion of the building that was still standing, was calling in for help. And they were mentioning the situation, how the building collapsed on the other side, and they were trying to evacuate that remaining portion that was still standing but they didn't know where the fire exit was, the exit stair. As residents, we need to understand where our exits are because you never know when you might need that exit. And when I was hearing that residents saying they don't know where the exit is, and they're trying to get out. And then on top of it, when you're in that extreme stress, you're not really thinking properly. So it's hard to then to try to find that exit when you're in a state of panic. And so if they perhaps had known how the building was laid out and where the exits were located, that would have perhaps alleviated a little bit of stress. So it's so important to take the time to know your building, find floor plans, or simply if you can't find floor plans of your building, just walk around your building. Take a moment to understand that floor plate that you're on. So if you're on level, let's say five, understand where those exits are. Now, typically most buildings are designed very much a similar in a similar fashion. You have your floor plate, you have your elevator core that's in the center, which contain the elevator shafts, which hold the elevators within. And then you might have air shafts and so on, but you wouldn't see that from the outside. So upon that core, on each end of that floor plate of that building, you're gonna have fire exits. And every floor plate has at least two exits, depending on that size of that floor plate. And then the other thing that is taken into account when an architect is designing a building is that at the end of each corridor, each fire exit stair is not more than six meters at the end of that corridor in order to allow that resident enough time to escape and get to a fire exit in time and then take the exit out and be able to safely get out of the building. So those are key principles that every building has. So make sure that you know where the two exits are, not just the one, but both exits. Understand where is the closest exit and then understand as well, which is very important, is where does that exit lead out to? Because you could be in a situation that you notice, for example, the building collapsed on the east side, or perhaps there was a fire on the east side. Well, you don't want to exit on the ground level on the east side. So perhaps it's better to take the other exit because at ground level, it exits on the opposite side. But in order to make that decision, you need to understand the layout of your building. Knowing that is so important. And one way to do that is just to, again, walk around through the building. But one thing that I do, and I actually understand my exits very well not only do I know the floor plan of my building but I also use the fire exits so I use my fire exit stairs as my personal workout as my master stairs and I just go up up and down I go all the way to the penthouse level and I also know where the exit is to get up on the roof which is also something that could be handy one day, I don't know. And then I go all the way down to parking level. So in my building, there's five levels of parking. So I know exactly that if I am in the parking level, I can get up to the ground floor, exit out. And I know where each of the two exits, I know where they exit out. And I know what street they go out onto. So if I'm ever in a situation that I need to make an escape, 
I'm really comfortable with the exits. Like I know them pretty well. And so I make sure to understand them and I use them as my own gym as well. So sometimes I'll take one stair and I'll work out and I'll do like two or three rounds up and down on those stairs. And depending on if I really wanna challenge myself, I'll also add weights and then I just take the stairs as my personal workout. And it's a great place to work out. It's very quiet. I never, I rarely see anyone in the stairwells. <laughs> so it's quite quiet and you get a really good workout in the process and you just develop a better understanding. The other thing to pay attention to is that each building has a unique exiting system. So for me in my building, the lower level parking exit stair is connected with the upper level and they exit out onto the ground floor together. But in some buildings, it might actually be that the exit is designed differently where the parking levels are separate from the upper level and they exit or transfer, sometimes stairs even transfer exits as well. Again, this is very technical, but all you really need to do is just go and understand your building, go explore and tour your building so that you really understand those exits. So whenever you are in a situation, you can actually formulate an escape plan. Now, believe it or not, it might sound like a fire in your building, or in this case, a portion of it collapsing might not happen to you, but you never know. And I was actually in a situation in one of the buildings that I lived in, there was an actual fire. It was an older building and the fire alarm went off and this was in the middle of the night, I believe. And usually as many of you who perhaps live in a building, this happens a lot where you have fire testing alarms going off constantly or someone pulls the alarm and it's going off for hours. And sometimes, or a lot of times, I'm included in this too, I even ignore the fire alarms, which is also bad to do, don't do that. And actually that's one thing I learned from that incident is to really acknowledge each fire alarm and at least understand, okay, that's a test or, you know, okay, this is obviously an unusual fire alarm. But that night, the fire alarm went off and I was like, wait, this is unusual. We're not having a test alarm today. And it's at an unusual time. It's in the middle of the night. And I felt like I was smelling smoke. I I'm like, okay, something is up. Let me just check check things out. And so first thing I did was I went and I opened the door that leads into the corridor. So my entrance door, I opened the door and I couldn't believe it. I saw smoke and I was smelling the smoke too. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is actual fire. This is an actual, not a drill. We actually have a fire. And this was the first time even me living in a building that was experiencing a fire. And the first thing I saw was in that particular building, I was living at the end of the floor plate. So I was like a corner unit in that floor plate. So I knew that I had an exit that was the closest to me. And I knew there was another exit on the other side of the elevator. So at the end of the corridor. So I saw the smoke located more from the side that my unit was located. So the smoke seemed to be more clear on the opposite end. And then I closed the door. Cause I'm like, okay, well, okay. Whoa, we really have a fire here. We have a fire situation. The second thing I did was I went out on my balcony and I looked on either end. I knew it seemed to me where the smoke was coming from was that it was along the wing that I was located, my unit was located. So I went outside, I looked over and I saw smoke. The other thing I was paying attention to was the color of the smoke. The smoke was getting really intense every second. And the other thing I noticed was I didn't see any firemen. The alarms were going off and I saw people out on the streets evacuating, but I didn't see any of the first responders on site. And the smoke was getting worse and I kept looking and I can tell that it was on the lower levels because the smoke was coming from below upwards and the smoke was starting to come into the unit as well. So I closed all the windows and so on, but I kept waiting for the first responders and I didn't see anyone. So the second thing I did, and this was literally within seconds, believe it or not, is I called 911 because I wasn't gonna rely on the fact that someone was going to show up because it seemed to me that somehow the alarm system and the first responders, something in the middle wasn't happening and I didn't want the fire to get worse. So first thing I did was picked up the phone, called 911, I spoke with them, I said, hey, there's a fire going on, I live here, blah, blah, blah. I don't see any first responders, is anyone coming, you know, yada yada and at that time I wanted to evacuate 
but I had a dog at the time and he was very old <laughs> and I'm like, okay, how am I gonna go down? I think I was 25 flights of stairs all the way down with a dog. So I was on the phone with 911 and they had mentioned to me, just stay in your unit right now because they're gonna try to control the fire and I was explaining the situation. They were able in the end to get control of the fire and I didn't have to evacuate. And if there is a situation like that, make sure to call 911. Just don't wait for someone to do it for you or if the alarms are connected or not because you never know. In this case, I don't know what happened, why the first responders weren't there right away. I don't know what happened with the fire alarm and that communication, but don't assume that the first responders are coming because everyone was waiting and hopefully someone else called but when I called it seemed like I was the first caller to report the issue so make sure to report the issue find a way out and if you are speaking with 911 responder make sure to talk to them about the situation and they can help you through that situation as well